what can be the limiting factor for certain organizations or certain people to jump into this technology space? I think I think there are a number of factors to consider. I think the, the first issue is cost. And uh, for many organizations, uh, making that step could be an issue uh, because of cost. They simply can't, uh, you know, maybe afford it. And this is why what we do in our company is to provide solutions that cater to a broad range of organizations, from small organizations to larger organizations. And so I think I think that's one of the issues. But even still, when when with discounted uh, prices and subsidized prices, sometimes it's not even um, something that some organizations can have um and then for some it's just doubt you know it's and we've we've seen it with so many different companies and organizations when tech was going a particular way and they just relaxed you know we see saw it with nokia and what basically happened with smartphones coming into the picture and and you know being rendered irrelevant and so it's it's something that we most organizations sometimes uh don't take a take note of that that the world is actually changing. And so, so many of them are kind of late to make the move. And by the time they make the move, um, they've really lost a huge part of the market share. So I think I think it's it's something that they be, need to really look into, become aware and, and really think about, okay, because right now the future of training our employees in terms of you know some of the skills and some of the issues that may be critical for their job could be done online. I think that's obviously a solution. Um, and that obviously would save time instead of having someone come and having to walk someone. So they could actually integrate that into the, into the entire training system. Uh, so I think I think that's also it. Doubt, doubt about what the future is going to hold. Doubt about whether or not, you know, this edutech move or this edutech uh, trend will have an impact on their organization. But I think many organizations are starting to catch on, and so many of them are starting to realize the importance of um, edutech and, and having it integrated into their system. And many organizations are starting to understand the power of big data and uh, you know, having a lot of information. And obviously that has also come with a lot of uh, data privacy regulations. And uh, the, the purpose of that has been to curb some of these issues because I mean, what some of the most dangerous companies, uh, and I say dangerous in not, not in a very negative way, but in as to describe the potential power that these companies could have is big data. Those companies that are collecting data, uh, analyzing data. Um, to the end that they can actually predict what a customer wants before they even order something. And they can, you know, they can basically uh, put that in your face and you say, I've been thinking about this all this time, but uh, they've actually just, they've been managing and, and looking into all your, uh, your, your, your consumer behaviors. And they've basically navigated you and categorized you into a, into a, a certain section or a certain, uh, you know, uh, box. And so now they know what you're going to do, what you want before you even want it. And they just bring it up in your face. So, and I think many people are shocked. They, they're like, oh, I was thinking about this. You know, I was talking about this or something. But, uh, you know, that kind of technology is, is now available. And, uh, yeah, big data is, is, is doing a lot uh, to that end. So something to look into. And I think that's something that most organizations need to start thinking about. Okay. So what do you suggest governments, schools, uh corporates public private sector should uh, actually equip or prepare for them to mm. be able to have this edutech space uh work uh, effectively for them mm. so any like i think such a need that they need to work on or something like that i think i think specifically I, I think let me start with government i think government needs obviously to set up the right infrastructure yeah. that will facilitate um, you know, edutech to to basically run smoothly, and, and a part of that could be you know infrastructure in you know uh, telecoms, for example, and with the overall end goal of, for example, making data cheap, you know, so that anyone can at any time um, you know, go online and do a lesson on that or do a, a live lesson. But if, if so many of these structures are not in place and data is expensive, mm -hmm. uh, it could lead to a huge lag. So I think government needs to come on board and basically uh, be part of the process of, of, of setting up the infrastructure and, and putting incentives and, and actually pouring part of their budget into making sure that the infrastructure that will allow for you know um, many institutions or educational institutions to transition to learning online 
are in place. So I think that's critical. And I think for, for, for high schools and for universities right now, I think they need to really start thinking about how they can best, you know, make the um, transition from, you know, the traditional ways of learning uh, to having, you know, some of these edutech solutions, having a state of the art learning management platforms, because ultimately uh, the effectiveness and the success of many of these organizations or these institutions in the education space, high schools, universities, will be determined by who has taken the first move and who has the most advanced ways of, you know, uh, for example, learning to design and develop courses or who has the most interactive online learning platform because that's where we're slowly going to. And, and, and if they can also look into AI and integrating AI into that entire um, system, I think that would do a great deal. And for private organizations, I think, um, I think in terms of HR and uh, specifically for HR departments, I think they need to start to look into, you know, migrating their training and, and taking their training online, um, you know, for most of, you know, so that for most of their employees, and that will basically help them to standardize some of the processes uh, that will be engaged and to, you know, equip you know, their organization, employees, their employees with the right knowledge that will allow them to navigate the industry better. So I think, I think that's, that's what all these uh, institutions need to, to look into and that's how they have to look at things. I think it's also cheaper for the HR, you know, there's no cost on catering mm. <laughs> hungry <Exactly>. employees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, precisely. It's cost effective. In the long term, it's cost effective and it can be beneficial. Yeah. and standardized so you instead of having uh, hiring someone to come and train your employees in a particular subject you hire professionals to for the e-learning design and development process and to even deploy a learning management platform for you and then you just do all the training online and everything is basically done online and you standardize the process in the long term you're going to save on cost and you're going to have standardized training everyone gets the same kind of training and whenever you need to make upgrades and updates that that's the probably the only additional cost that you would have and maybe some hosting fees so i think i think it's definitely something um, that's critical for most organizations to look into yeah, I like the, the the part where you say government should actually have these infrastructures in, in place and also ensure that uh, telecom Absolutely. is actually affordable because currently Absolutely. what we are having are uh, teachers sending uh, assessments or, or all these notes via parents' uh, social media platforms like WhatsApp and then mm. the parents would then probably download or and print or just give the phone to the child for them to read from there and then submit. I mean, social social media already has its own um, disturbances yeah. that come up. You can't ignore right. a book, you can't ignore a story, you can't ignore bad news coming through. Mm, right, right. Uh, so why uh, you're speaking that platform? Yeah. So obviously having a dedicated platform specifically for that is good. And I, I don't think, you know, going on WhatsApp, that kind of model is a very sustainable model in in the long term. I think having, and also, I'm also a brain coach, and I think it's something that I've, I've mentioned before. So I basically um, train people to learn faster, you know, just like, you know, the, the kind of techniques that are necessary, because I had learning challenges growing up and um, basically made the transition to basically consuming information at a really fast rate. So I, I trained this. And it's not effective to basically have a document sent to a WhatsApp platform and the student downloads and reads uh, because we need to look into the fact that not everyone learns the same way. People don't learn things the same way. And, you know, the, and, and we actually understand that because we're all obviously into e-learning design and development. Um, and we, we have to understand, number one, you have visual learners. These are people who learn by seeing stuff. So, for example, videos, infographics, any types of images when they're learning helps them to remember more. And then you have auditory learners who basically learn more from listening and hearing uh, someone relay information. And that's how they basically uh, get knowledge faster. And then you have 
kinesthetic learners who learn through action. And uh, these are the people who are really good even with sports, except because they learn through uh, you know different types of actions. And so what we do even in the e-learning design, design and development process is to make sure that we address all the different types of learners, the visual learners. So we have um, graphic designers who uh, basically design, you know, you know, state of the art graphics to ensure that whatever is being said is correlate, correlating with, you know, the videos and, and the graphics that are being shown for the video visual learners. And then we have, um, you know, on audio voiceover, which is professionally engineered so that the auditory learners can have that. And then we have exercises afterwards for the kinesthetic learners who have to do something in order for them to learn. So now if you're telling me that right now, the majority of schools have adopted a system in which the, you know, students learn through voice notes and uh, basically uh, documents being sent, you've already lost a, a, a great percentage of the students. Yes. You've already yes. lost them. And if they don't do so well, it obviously will affect the, the results that will uh, come up at the end of the year, you know, the, the final examinations, and they're not doing so well because they're not being taught the way they should be taught. You know, uh, so so that's not a sustainable solution, and it doesn't work for everyone because it's only the auditory learners who benefit from voice notes and WhatsApp, and you know, and then what happens to the visual learners? Maybe some of the graphics on on this part that needs to be read that could help. Um, so I think I think that's not a sustainable solution. I don't think it's effective, and I don't think it's beneficial for the country's educational system. Um, as a whole, so I think I think that's something that really, that really needs to be looked into. So many students, may, I would advise many of these schools to make the decision: go online, get a learning management platform, hire professionals to do the e-learning design and development process, have your courses in place, and ensure that you, um, you whatever you learn or whatever you teach uh, to these learners applies to visual learners, auditory learners, and kinesthetic learners.